kind, kind words, uh, Dina. I'm very honored to be here, and also it gives you a marvelous possibility to come to Israel, which is something I cherish and like doing very often. Um, I don't know really <laughs> how to how to speak or what to say exactly. So I'll be very personal for a couple of minutes before I address uh, this issue because it is now more than 20 years since the fall of the Berlin Wall and the topic of a European Jewry is not just in a scholarly topic for me. I was perceived in Jewish circles, even in Israel and America and across Europe, as a sort of quintessential European Jew, marking the idea that there should be a European, a very positive and strong European Jewish pillar emerging after 1989, and that there were, that such a Jewish pillar in Europe was going to be crucial for the greater Jewish world, not unlike having a third leg and a stool giving it a certain stability and importance both for Israel and for the United States. And therefore, I sort of was very associated with the notion of a forward-looking, cohesive, positive-oriented, voluntary European Jewish identity. The person who speaks before you now, 20 years later, is someone who has had to bend in front of reality and by that, I do not mean that there are not Jews and a positive Jewish life across Europe, but that in all honesty, if I have to measure my hopes in the early 90s with the reality of today, in strictly speaking, and we have to go back to definitions, can I say that a truly strong European Jewish identity has emerged, that vital third leg of the stool that I was hoping for two decades ago. I am not sure. So in all honesty, intellectual, academic honesty, I can tell you that there are Jews in Europe, that there are Jews who are very active, very productive, very important across Europe, and that the presence of Jews across Europe is a crucial presence for the Europeans. I am not so sure that there is an important European Jewish identity as opposed to Jewish identity in Europe that would be so important for the Israelis or the Americans, even though I postulated originally that such an identity was crucial to give Israel a sense of having a bridgehead of fellow Jews in the lands that were supposed to be the forsaken lands of the Holocaust, and to give Americans a greater modesty in their understanding that there were other Jews out there who were also important, and also a feeling that you cannot forget history, but you can overcome part of history. And the European post-war project of reconciling oneself across Europe was an important project of which the Jews have been a fundamental part, at least especially after the 1989. But all of this, all of this that I'm saying, has not necessarily added up to what I call a European Jewish identity. In other words, Jews that walk around with the 12 stars above their heads, not like a Christian halo, but as an identity, as a clear one. Let me try to be specific and explain a little bit why. And with this, I'm not saying that there is not a positive Jewish presence. There is, and a crucial one for the Europeans, but not quite what I had expected two decades ago. First reasons, the word Europe itself, it's not a word, it's a Rorschach ink blot. You know those special ink blots that psychologists use so that people look at them and they can figure out who the people are, what their fears are, and whatever. That's the word Europe. So you can't really assume by talking about a European Jewish identity that it is just a geographic place. No, it will make vibrating chords in the minds of Jews around the world that in many ways already handicap the concept. Europe was where Jewish life used to be. Europe was the place in which Jewish life was murdered, two-thirds of the Jews. Europe was the place from which American Jewry came, and Europe was the place from which Israel came. And um, Shlomo Abineri's words, of course, 
Israel is of Europe, but not in Europe or even European. So it's not a neutral term. It's not like talking Southeast Asia or Northwest Canada or something like that. And the term crosses the historical divides. In other words, it takes two seconds from people chatting about Europe and how nice the European Union is and how useful it is for biological research or something to revert immediately to the notion of the Europe of the horror. It takes two seconds, which means that we're still in very unsolvable, very wet lands. You can't walk steadily with this concept. In the moment of the Iraq war when France and Germany went toward the Russia against Bush, who was going to inaugurate, to launch America into the Iraq war, the reaction of most American Jewry was that Europe was back at Munich 1938. This is, gives you an idea of how close we are, 60 years, 70 years is nothing, to reverting to the notion of the European as the horror of the past. Christian Europe, Nazi Europe is worth. So the European Jewish identity is already loaded with this very complex term. On top of it, what do we mean by Europe? Is it the 27 countries of the European Union? Is it, where is Switzerland in that case? Is it the wider continent? Not so easy either. So I would say that there is an identity of Jews in Europe, a European identity, perhaps in the future, perhaps not. And part of the problem is that uh, when I saw the title I was given, the Jew between the European vision and the national state, I tried to imagine if you could be anywhere in Europe where you could have such a lecture, and if as a year Jew across Europe you could even respond to this topic, how Jews in Paris or in London would see this topic, and the reaction would be, what is it all about, and why? <laughs> Let me be very brief in two seconds and tell you that if the Jews of Europe today have to hesitate between something and something, it is belong between the nation state and their commitment to Israel. It's not between the nation state and the European Union. And that is another added element, not just to the geography of the word Europe and its complexity, is the role and presence of Israel inside Jewish life across Europe today. It is not lessening, it is increasing with time. Israel was the place where the Western European Jews felt the Ostjuden who really were living in horrible parts of Europe should go. I mean, even the Yishuv before Israel. After the creation of Israel, the Western European Jews after the Holocaust said that it was a fantastic place for the refugees to go, but not for me. I'm a very, we had the shock of the Shoah, but I'm happy because I'm a proud British Jew, or I'm a proud French Jew because of General de Gaulle and the resistance, or I'm a proud Swedish or Swiss Jew because they were neutral, or I'm a proud Italian Jew because Italy was always so cute in a way. The horror in Italy was never quite like the German one. Or a proud something or other, or you're not a proud German Jew, of course, after the war, but there are Jews in Germany. What has happened was that concomitantly with the follow the Berlin Wall, you had what I call the graying of Europe, which meant that the Holocaust, the coming to terms with the Shoah, contributed to creating a sort of reverse underground European identity as all countries came to terms with their relative guilt in the Shoah, which meant that Switzerland, Sweden, the neutral countries had to confess to how much they had abetted the project. But there was one consequence to this, and not a small consequence, which was that the term Europe that was built right after the war, of course it was a new Europe with a never again to that past, but at the same time, by creating this notion of a European grayness, people realized to what an extent each of their national traditions was not so pure, not so clean. So France had Vichy, of course, the Swedes had the whole commitment of Sweden to the steel that it went sold to the Nazis. The Swiss had the bank scandals. The British, well, the British were always in a crazy position because of what they did to the Yishuv and the mandate. But all of a sudden, nastier things came out. And somehow, this great post-war notion of a national identity, I am proud of being a French Jew, this or that, kind of became more fragile. But 
Did this lead the Jews of these nations to say, all right, France was guilty of this or that, but I'm proud to be a European Jew now. It didn't happen. There was no alchemy that really turned one to the other. It didn't happen because in a crazy manner, in a very complex manner, the European Union, of which, is, which is such a crucial actor, was never equipped to take on this kind of symbolic meaning and role. It was a European economic at first, technocratic, industrial, political argument, uh, institution, but not one that felt it had to sort of take on this European responsibility. These were national responsibilities. The European Union was, saw itself as a child of the new world. In other words, it was the European answer to the horrors of the past and not to be blamed for that past. But the rest of the Jewish world and the Jews themselves still had this notion of Europe as being not an um, addition of identities, but rather a subtraction. In other words, the word Europe means less than the constituent parts. And this you have to, I mean, I lived this through conferences and meetings throughout the 90s and 2000s when, let me give you a very clear example, when Germany, United Germany, decided to bring its capital to Berlin, leaving Bonn, the major point of the Germans was to reassure all the Europeans that by moving back to Berlin, they were not going to become the old Germans of the past. So they spent countless efforts telling everyone, we are the new Germany, we're moving back to Berlin, but it has nothing to do with the past. It's the same old, small, bucolic, little Germans we feel so guilty. The only people who hated the idea and were very scared about this Germany becoming European were American Jews who were saying, no, no, please, you must retain this German clear identity because we don't want you to enter into this muddy pot called Europe. Please retain, if you know some of your historians of Germany, the irony of the American Jews wanting Germany to have its own Sonderweg once more a kind of notion of saying, no, no, we want you to remain a special case. This was something that was quite unexpected. Now, this is just to give you a feeling of the complexity of these terms. They're not neutral, and they're value-laden and emotionally wrapped up. Now, what has happened in terms of a European Jewry? Has it espoused the values of Europe, of post-war Europe? Yes and no. And why am I saying that? Yes, in terms of all the international agreements, all the notions of human rights, all the anti-ethnic positions, all the lack of religious identity, all the protections that Europe produced. No, because at the same time, these very values, in a sense, turned Israel into a kind of ostracized exception with respect to that never again. In other words, the very basis of uh, the Israeli identity goes against the very basis of the post-war European identity because of the international commitments, no ethnic identity, no ethnic states, no, you know, no religious identity and so forth that lies at the basis of the European compact of World War II. So there was already a split there in values. The other reason is perhaps more positive. Everyone is European for their own reasons, and they breathe Europe like we breathe oxygen. Do we sit around saying, ah, this molecule is fabulous, how rich it is, how delightful for me to be breathing it? No, we only know that it's there when we don't have it. And that is, in a sense, the European success. But you don't measure these successes, you measure the problems rather than the one doesn't measure the successes. Now, the reconciliation of the different pasts took place, but without the Jewish component. The Franco-German reconciliation of post-war Europe should have taken place as far as I'm concerned in 1918, because then you would have had to reconcile pointed hat German Jews with red pant-wearing French Jews along with their respective countries. The very notion of reconciliation after World War II took place without Jews in its midst. There were no more German Jews to reconcile with the French Jews. So that the Jews of Europe have been there without being there. And sometimes I think of it as maybe we are the people of the 
Heisenberg principle, you know, these electrons that are there and not there, they, they're both there and not there, or both in both places at both times, and maybe they can even be teleported, one, con one content from the other. And it seems it's like the case. The Jews have been part and parcel of this European reawakening, but slowly and inside their national identities. And one must understand that the European project, as it was created after the war, was only one part of the project. Many Jews were socialists and communists. And the last thing they wanted was to be in integrated into a European project that was Catholic at the origins, the Gasperi, Schumann, uh, Adenauer. Consequently, not even at the founding moment of Europe did you have Jews that were imminently, totally committed to it. They became interested in post-1989 Europe, but could also pull back much more quickly than you could imagine, I mean, than you could assume. Now, uh, I don't want to, I want to, I'm giving you a negative position because I, I think it's important to understand the cultural, psychological coordinates that make it so that you don't have a massive European jury out there, not, not in terms of numbers, I think Sergio de la Pergola gave you the numbers, but in terms of the symbol, as Europeans rather than as Jews inside Europe. Now, the, I mentioned rapidly Israel. Perhaps it is the most significant reason why a European jury is split within itself across Europe and in a position of ambiguity with respect to the European Union. Israel on one end, anti-Semitism on the other, I compare to the spokes of a wheel. In other words, they are keeping the various Jews of Europe together in terms of a common pursuit. You do not have British Jews, French Jews, Jews in Germany or German Jews or Italian Jews discussing European things together. When they come together, they're discussing either anti-Semitism, real or perceived, or Israel. Consequently, it's a very strange, hollow European Jewish identity. It's not an issue about, well, do we agree with codicil number four that the European Union has provided? More significantly even is the fact that why should the Jews be more European than the Europeans? Why should they be running around with these 12 stars on their head when most of Europe today is lackadaisical with respect to Europe, takes it for granted, or at any rate cynical or perplexed or, shall we say, neutral? Yes, it's okay, sorry. So it means basically having a somewhat ironical detached position vis-a-vis -vis Europe. Then we have another obstacle, and it's something that has to be taken into account. If we want an identity in these days, it has to have institutions that go with it. And the institutions in our pluralist democratic age would presume that there is a pluralist democratic process with which to carry them about. I can guarantee you that there are no representative democratic institutions of European Jews today in which Jews of Europe would come along and vote or elect people to their positions. And that is a major problem. You have the European Council of Jewish Communities, which has been nominated by different members of the council, but how do the council members become members? It's not always obvious. It is kind of professionals coming together. And in a sense, to go back to the notion of what does Europe mean? Is it the 27? What are its borders? And I do not wish to make any judgment on this since I am the recipient of this lecture position here in the Cantor Center. But Mr. Cantor, who is the head of the European Council of Jewish Communities, is a Russian. Dina tells me he has a home in Geneva, but Geneva is not part of the European Union. Russia is not part of the European Union. The European component of this element is, if we want to talk about the 27, perhaps the person who will be elected to run the European Council of Jewish Communities should be a member of these famous 27 countries. And I will not, it's so it has nothing to do with the gentleman in question. It has to do with, have there been European-wide elections as to, you know, among the Jews? No, there have not been. Um, there are other issues such as, you know, the joint activities which are crucial to bring together Jews of Europe. That too is not run with a European base in which people either elect or create. And so we have a problem of representativity. 
We have an even deeper problem that Jews are like mercury drops. If you touch it, they splinter into four different factions. And we, I don't have to tell you that because most of us here are probably Jewish and we know this phenomenon. And the issue is that um, in such institutions, it's what the French used to call variable geometry for Europe. You had, before the Arab revolutions, they had brought in Tunisian, Moroccan delegations to these European encounters, not part of Europe, not exactly democratic, not exactly in the European context, but Europe became what in French is called the fourtou. In other words, it's this place where the European Jewish institutions would put groups that didn't fit into America or Israel, and it, I have to tell you that European Jewish institutions also contain often Australians. Now, is this the way to get into a strong European Jewish identity? I am not sure. Uh, not at least in, in the, uh, my understanding of what such a term could be. Having said this, of course, it's all creative and very important, and we are a global people, so maybe it's a small detail about this European Jewish identity. It's just a place in which we have thriving Jews. And I'm perfectly willing to take that as, as that and leave it at that, as a place in which Jews in metropolises across Europe play a significant role in Jewish culture and in Jewish identity and do a work for, on behalf of Israel and anti-Semitism. There is another element about Europe which is somewhat problematic. And I mean, I'm giving you a provocative reading of this, but it's also probably like a disappointed lover <laughs> who is saying, well, that person really finally wasn't so great after all, because I still do believe in the importance of a European Jewish presence, but it clearly can take more with content. And it's globalization. Europe, and this is not a problem linked to the Jews, it's a problem linked to the Europeans. Europe as an entity is both too small and too big. It's too small for the globe, I mean, we as Jews uh, are now heading off to Shanghai. I've already been in Hong Kong and there's Latin America. We're planetary people as we move about. So this notion of Europe, it's a bit small for being a planetary place. In other words, when the Jews were the cosmopolitans of Europe before the Shoah, now the same Jews would be cosmopolitans to cool, you know, with Shanghai and, and their uh, horizon and not just Europe because Europe was basically the world in which the world that counted at the time. Europe is also too big. It's too big for the kind of loyalties, and this is a problem of Europe today for the Europeans, that they feel it's out of hand, they don't know who's making the decisions, and therefore they want to go back to the power of the nation state. Their language, leaders they more or less have elected, a kind of control of an economic situation, it's an illusion, but it's a kind of illusion, and a feeling that at least inside the national border, the chaos of the world is somewhat blunted, whereas Europe isn't offering any of this. Finally, one has to say the following thing. If you're a European Jew, I have never heard a young European Jew tell me, wow, I may be going to Bratislava next year, I have heard many saying, well, of course I'm going to New York and I hope to get an internship in Singapore or maybe London, naturally. But Bratislava? No. Bratislava should be one of the directions of a strong European Jewish identity, in a sense, because, you know, you should have that kind of a framework. We can't kid ourselves. There's Europe and there's Europe. And in that sense, it's a very difficult um, wager to follow from that point of view. And so we are stuck with Jews in major cities and urban metropolises. As someone who has played a role in trying to strengthen European Jewish ties, let me tell you that to this day, if you get French and British Jews together, you're getting French and Brits together. They know nothing of each other in their institutions. Of course, they will come together for Israel and anti-Semitism, but they're not going to come together against America or to say we have a clear identity. And so we're also left with what I call a matryoshka of uh, snobism. No, that wouldn't be the right word. I would call it a, mat a matryoshka of, uh, of, of uh, no, it's a matryoshka of, I'll tell you what I mean is, I live where I live, but how can Jews possibly live down the road? The matryoshka begins like this. I'm a British Jew, World War II. We won, 
and therefore, and the UK never did anything wrong to its Jews, an uninterrupted tradition since 1760 at least, how can you live in France with Vichy? The French turn around and say, there are supposedly so-called Jews in Germany, how can they possibly live in Germany? The German Jews, most of whom come from Poland before they came from the Ukraine, the first world Jewish community came from Poland, turn around and tremble at the thought that there might even be young Jews in Poland. How can they possibly be living in Poland as though the horror of the camps had been made by the Poles, which of course they had not been. Jews in Poland will say, the Ukraine, my goodness, they should have learned their lessons in 1648 and gotten out of there. And then there's this blob called Russia, and people say, well, they have a lot of money, and they have a lot of money. That's how their action is. They throw up their hands. So, and then the Jews of Italy, oh, so refined, so nice, but, you know, 25,000 of them. How nice to have them there, because when we visit Italy, it's nice to have Jews, and so forth. This is what I call the matryoshka of values. Now, can you build a European Jewish identity on this very strong feeling of, I know I can live where I am, but the others, how can they? And this goes all the way down the road to the Hungarian Jews or wherever. And then it goes all the way up again in the other sense, such as, how dare you think I can't live where I live? I know my country better, and therefore you can't say that I can't live here because it's more complicated than you think, which is the reaction. So I'm not saying it's not going to happen, and this I will end my negative critique here, but there are structural reasons for this. And I will turn now to what I could consider, briefly put, the basis, perhaps, of a future European Jewish identity, which will not be the formal big European Jewish identity from sort of like a category of its own, but for what I would call the grassroots movement. Jews across Europe are like other Europeans. They, they have Erasmus fellowships. They study from one place to the other. They avail themselves of easy jet like everybody else, which means that you can, for 40 euros, hop around Europe freely. They travel. They are Europeans from that point of view. And they have created slowly, and I'm sorry I, I, I did not hear your lecture, a kind of virtual uh, Jewishness, a virtual Jewish European space, which is also a real space, of renewed roots, cultural places, itineraries, values, and presences, which I'm sure most of you who are Israelis, when you travel across Europe, in discover with great pleasure, because Europe, and by this I mean non-Jewish Europe, now takes care immensely about its Jewish roots, it's Jewish itineraries. If there is a town in which they discovered that in the basement of an old building there might have been a mikveh, you are going to get local, regional, state, and European money to restore it. And there'll be arrows pointing to it all over because the nasty tongues will say it's great for tourism, but the people living in these little towns will say, no, it's important. Pluralism is a value we now cherish. We may not have the Jews, but at least we have the reference of the fact that they used to be there. Consequently, we are now living across Europe with what I would call very happy grassroots Jewish identities of a cultural, symbolic, virtual, uh, intellectual, artistic way in style, which would have been unthinkable perhaps two decades ago or three decades ago. And I do want to end with this positively. However, I think that what we meant by a European Jewish identity or the Jew in Europe as caught between the nation state in Europe, by that we meant heavier political institutional structures. And I think the way of the future in terms of that Jewish representation will be instead coming from the lighter, the more cultural, the greater self-confidence, and the fact that slowly but surely Israelis going back to Europe will, with time, think less of the Shoah and the concentration camps and more about living places with Jews, how many or how few there may be that are around and as a place in which to have a renewed Jewish 
religious and cultural life. And that is not small. It's a great virtue and it is a great accomplishment for a continent in which the Jewish presence after the war was present but silent or in any way less visible. So it is a major victory and it is a victory in which the Jews have played the predominant part but it would not have been possible without the European context wanting it, commemorating it, honoring it, cultivating it as well, so that you cannot speak of a Jewish presence across Europe as a kind of Jewish ghetto-like thing of Jews hanging together. In our very complex worlds, the European end of this particular equation is absolutely crucial. But does this mean that we have before you a panel of groups of European Jews arriving as European Jews? I can only say not yet, if one wants to be optimistic, or perhaps it's not possible if one wishes to be realistic, and maybe end simply with the fact of saying that maybe the stakes are elsewhere, and this elsewhere implies that there are living Jews across Europe, and that we have. Thank you.